Right, today we're going to study the Maha Sakulu Dai Sutta, the greater discourse to Sakulu Dai, M77. The theme is why disciples respect and listen to the Buddha. Or generally we can say how effective a religious teaching is. And this is from ST 49.5a. This is the last sutta, it's a very long sutta, Majjhima Sutta. In the so last sutta in ST 49.5a. This uh, volume 49 is the, perhaps the longest volume so far in the Sutta Discovery series. It's a three part uh, volume on the life of the Buddha. Usually, the volumes will just start singly. I'll put together the I'll set a theme and then I look for the suttas, like see how they are related and translate them usually as a set. So when you study one sutta, will will mention another or relate to another or another sutta has some common themes or some common verses or some common sayings with the main sutta. So uh, sometimes this kind of, uh, uh, sometimes the, the, the topics grow, so they become double volume. In this case, the life of the Buddha is very interesting, very important, and there are lots of materials on it, so it grew to uh, three volumes. In fact, there's another volume coming later on, much later on, and there is a lot we can, we need to know, we need to study on the life of the Buddha. So the Mahasakuru Dai Sutta uh, relates to the nature of the Buddha, if you like, the nature of the Buddha's awakening. <clears throat> the style of the Sutta is much more akin to the Diga Nikaya Sutta, actually, because it gives us a very broad overview of the Buddha's teaching. It is in important ways to impress the beginner. In this case, to impress the wanderer Sakuludai. Sakuludai is one of the, those very rare kind of wanderers. Most wanderers uh, of the Buddha's time would be, to put very simply, quite frivolous. They're not really serious in their practice and they, they just kind of uh, renounce the world or join groups. Uh, because it's a convenient way of life. But Sakura Dai happens to be one of those very uh, respectful wanderer uh, who has this deep respect for the Buddha. So, in summary, this sutta, which is named after him, there are at least two suttas named after him. This is the greater Sakurudai Sutta Maha Sakurudai Sutta, and there's one more, the Chula Sakurudai Sutta, the smaller one, the shorter one. <coughs> so in this Sutta, M77, it tells the Buddha that uh, the, the, he respects the Buddha for five reasons. And he, he gives reason, the reasons. But the Buddha says uh, those reasons are not good enough. Then the Buddha gives his own five reasons, <laughs> and these five reasons effectively summarizes the whole of the, the Buddha's teachings. So, in a sense, uh, we, after studying Buddhism for decades, you begin to uh, more or less know the, the Buddha's style of teaching. Sooner or later, he's going to tell you everything. And anyway, you can ask him any question; he always leads back to the to the Dharma, to, to the to his awakening. But the way he presents his teachings is very interesting in different ways. There are, there are variations on a theme and they are often very beautiful variations as we, as we will see in today's sutta. So, <clears throat> the, the introduction is very short but the sutta is very long in this case. Uh, but introduction is quite important for you to read to a good idea on the nature of the sutta. I give you a summary of it. The, uh, 
because of the length of this sutta, I, I will be summarizing within this space of time given to this video. The sutta starts off at the, in the, the Buddha is residing in the squirrel's feeding ground in the bamboo grove, Veluvana, in Rajagaha. And it was uh, at that time some very well known wanderers were living in the wondrous park in the peacock's feeding ground. Right, so I'm on page 200, you know, at the, in the Sutta itself, I'm reading section 2. So we have two places mentioned here. Right, the Buddha is residing in the bamboo grove uh, in the squirrel's feeding ground. It's possible that the peacock's feeding ground also is in the bamboo grove, because the bamboo grove is quite big. So various wanderers have gathered together here and the names are given Anabhara, Vara, Dhara, Sakuludai and various other well-known wanderers. And they, are, they got together and they, they, they are talking to one another in a worldly way, talking about worldly things and so on, in a very loud and easy way. This is the usual way that wanderers are depicted in the suttas. And then the Buddha comes along. It was early in the morning, and the Buddha is going to go into his arms round. And uh, he thought it was too early, so it's probably maybe five o'clock in the morning, perhaps, maybe earlier. So he visits this uh, the wondrous Sak and Sak Sakuluda. He speaks to him. So here we have a very good idea. This discourse records the Buddha's dialogue with the wondrous Sakuludai in the early hours of the morning, before the sun has risen, you might say. So it's a very interesting uh, situation here, if you like. Many of the suttas are like that, where, you know, if, so probably this interview may last, say, one hour, two hours at the most, and then the Buddha goes into Rajagaha in this case for Islam is round. So uh, the moment the Buddha comes, then Sakuludai is seeing the Buddha coming, he he kind of warns the gathered wanderers and said, Look, the Buddha's coming, you better be quiet, you know, because he's, he likes quiet. And then the Buddha comes along. Now we are in section eight. So the, the Buddha asked Sakuludai, okay, what are you talking about? Very often the Buddha would ask that, he would ask the monks. Here he asked Sakuludai because he, he wants to uh, kind of continue to carry on with the discussion with the talk that Sakuludai, so the wanderers have been discussing among themselves. Here Sakuludai, of course, is slightly embarrassed. So he uh, tells the Buddha, Never mind the talk, Bhante, for the sake of the talk for which we have now gathered. It will be not difficult for you, Bhante, to hear of this talk later. Right? So just say, well, let's discuss something more important. So he brings up this interesting topic. He says, In recent days, Bhante, when recluses and Brahmins of diverse sects gathered and sat together in the debating hall, uh, this topic arose. What a gain says for the people of Angamagata, and what a great gain says for the people of Angamagata that these teachers and, and recluses and different titles are given. It says that many kinds of great teachers have come to this to this place and they have come to Rajagaha for their range to treat. And then the six teachers are mentioned, six gurus of Purana, Kasapa, Makali Gosala, Ajita, Kesa, Kambali, Bakuda, Kachayana, Sanjaya, Bela, Tiputa, and Niganta, Nataputa. And uh, it says that there are these teachers and many other teachers here, so it's a very wonderful place to come and learn. Uh, so it says here, it's talking about the six teachers, but somehow, although they are famous and they, they have gathered together in Rajagaha. They are not well respected by their, by their pupils. Uh, in, in fact, the, the pupils don't respect them at all. If someone were to ask a question, the pupils would say, oh, don't go to the teacher, you come to me, I'll answer this for you. And sometimes when, when the teacher speaks, they would even 
counter go against the teacher. So, and, and this is the case with all the six teachers. This is what uh, Sakudai has observed and re to reports to the to the Buddha in uh, this kind of situation. Well, we, we find a, a similar feedback given by, for example, King Ajatasattu uh, to the Buddha in uh, in the Samanya Pala Sutta, for example. So here, what uh, Sakuruda is interested in says is the, that it's different in the case of the Buddha. He, he respects the Buddha for five reasons. And uh, the Buddha is different from these uh, six kinds of teachers. It says uh, <clears throat> that the Buddha is well respected. Okay, but before he gives the reason, five reasons, he says, number one, the, he says the main thing is the, the followers of the Buddha respect him very much. For example, uh, when when the monks are gathered and the Buddha is giving a teaching, not a single monk would uh, make any noise. They would silently listen to the Buddha. Let me just read an excerpt to show an example here in section 19. So this is Sakurudai talking. It says, once the Reptus Gautama was teaching Dharma to an assembly of several hundreds, then a certain disciple of the Reptus Gautama cleared his throat. <coughs> not that. A certain fellow brahmachari then nudged him uh, with his knee and, and, uh, and said, let the venerable be quiet, let the venerable not make a noise. The teacher, the blessed one, is teaching the Dharma. So th this is the respect, uh, and you might say even the, the charisma. So they don't even cough. But so, well, it is a... Uh, healthy monks, you might say, so they, they listen to the Dhamma very quietly. And uh, he, he makes another interesting remark. Uh, Sakurdai says in Sakyam 22, even if the disciples of the, the recluse Gautama, having fallen down with his fellow brahmacharis, given up, give up the training and return to the to the low life and was become lay people again, they still speak in praise of the teacher, speak in praise of the Dhamma, and speak in praise of the Sangha. And uh, they, they blame themselves other than the teacher for when they leave the order. And still they, they may work as park attendants or lay followers and they still keep to the five precepts and training rules. So these are really amazing, very uh, beautiful kind of uh, feedback that Mahasakuluta is giving uh, to the Buddha to show his respect uh, for the Buddha. Then it is the Buddha who actually asks him, Surah 26, he says, Udai, how many qualities do you see in me on account of which my disciples revere, respect, esteem and honor me? Uh, and uh, and in doing so, that they live in dependence on me. Here, did this uh, phrase dwell in dependence on someone, on the teacher, is very important here. It shows that we, like we today, who respect the historical Buddha, practice in accordance with the suttas, the Dharma, preserve the suttas, and in that sense, we are dependent on the Buddha as our teacher. But once we become strenuous, then we become, we begin to become independent, so to speak. So he asks Sakrudai how many qualities, in the, and Sakrudai replies and says, oh, five qualities. And the five qualities begin on, in section 28. So Sakrudai says, number one, the, the Buddha takes little food and speaks in praise of taking little food, just very restrained taking food and because of this that his, he thinks his disciples, the Buddha's disciples respect him. Number two, uh, he respects the Buddha because the Buddha takes any kind of alms food. And number three, okay, number two. Uh, sorry, number two is uh, any kind of robe. Okay? The Buddha wears any kind of robe. Number three, the Buddha takes any kind of alms food. Number four, the Buddha uses any kind of lodging. And number five, the Buddha is solitary. He lives alone and he praises solitude. Uh, 
So here we have, in other words, Sakura Dai praising a Buddha in terms of uh, simplicity and restraint in terms of the four supports. Food, uh, rope, uh, and, and shelter. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't mention uh, health aspect, but instead of that you have sol solitude. But the general idea is the Buddha lives in a very simple life, and because of this, the Buddha says, I respect him very much. Okay, so this is the long introduction. It takes like uh, the 28 uh, sections. Then from uh, 29 onwards, the Buddha begins, be, the Buddha replies to him. Actually, even section 29 up to uh, 30, 33, the Buddha hasn't begun his teaching yet. The Buddha is, in a sense, uh, correcting Sakludai. He's saying, okay, you, you have these five reasons, you, you think my followers respect me, but then uh, there are problems with these five reasons, he says. For example, if you talk about little food, if you think that my followers respect me because I take very little food, I have other followers, other monks, who take even less food than me. So in section 29.2, he tells Udayi, he says, but Udayi, there are disciples of mine who take only a cupful of rice, for example, or only half a cup, or a, a bilwa fruit, or only half a bilwa fruit. It's a very small fruit. Now, of course, these monks can sustain themselves on such little food because they, they meditate also. So the Buddha says, well, if you compare to these monks who take so little, I, I take much more than them, so that's not a valid reason. Okay, it's actually countering uh, Sakuladai for praising him. Then is number two. He says, okay, you, you, you say that my followers are spent because I wear any kind of robes, but there are my followers, my monks, who, who wear dust heap robes. They, they collect pieces of rags thrown away which are very rough cloth, and then they stitch them together. Hmm? And then they wear this very rough kind of cloth, and sometimes they, they, they get rag ropes from the charnel ground, where the, the corpse you know, is wrapped with this shawl, and, and it, it, they take this and wash it clean, and then kind of dye it. And uh, these ropes are very rough. So it, because my, my own robe is donated by this, this uh, followers and disciples and my robe is even finer. So it's not really a valid, valid reason to say my followers are spanky because of simplicity of robe. Uh, what, what he's saying is he's saying that even his followers are worthy of that kind of respect because they too uh, are simple in their lifestyle, so to speak. And then number three, uh, is uh, arms food again? He says his followers, in section 31.2, his followers are arms food eaters. In other words, they only go around collecting arms food and, and eat from the bowl. Whereas in the Buddha's case, sometimes he would go to houses, people would offer very, very nice, very well, specially cooked food for them, for the, for the Buddha and the monks. Uh, so here the Buddha is saying these monks would observe rules about food, like going on arms round, door to door, uh, and only taking food that they can gather from such an arms round. And that they're even strict about some of these uh, observances, like they, they would not uh, go to inhabited areas uh, where there are lots of people, uh, and they would not sit down even when invited. Right? So they're so strict as that. These are common with actually non buddhists also. They would not sit down anywhere to eat it where, where it's not proper, in other words. So they would collect the food and go back to their solitary, solitary uh, lodging somewhere in the forest and eat alone. So some, what the Buddha is saying here, some of these other monks are even more strict than the Buddha himself. And then lodging again, uh, the Buddha has a little hut, a little cell, in the um, squirrel's feeding ground, but there are other monks who are tree dwellers, uh, tree food dwellers who live under trees, who live in the open, uh, who sometimes live without any roof for eight months. The four months, of course, are the months of the rain, so that's, where only, that's the only time they would take shelter. 
So the Buddha says, not not fair to praise him merely because he is uh, simple in lodging the other monks, so he's a bit more simple, more strict in the uh, observance of simplicity of lodging. And then solitude, what about solitude? Here the Buddha says there are other monks who are forest dwellers, who live in remote lodgings, live all alone, and uh, they only meet they only come into communion with the Sangha, they only meet the other monks once in two weeks, once a fortnight for the recitation of the Patimokha, for example. So otherwise you don't see them. Okay? So there you are. So the Buddha says these five reasons are not really valid. And uh, then the Buddha says, okay, but I have five reasons which are the valid ones. And now the teaching actually begins from section 36. Now, if you want a summary of all these five reasons, they are given in the introduction on page 197, section 221. Okay? So you can see, no, sorry, not, not this. Yeah, yeah. correct, yes, 197. So you can see the big numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay? So this is the first reason. It's because the Buddha observes the higher moral virtue. The Buddha keeps to all the uh, rules that he has made, and uh, so others follow the example. Right? So this he has in common with other, the other monks too. Then number two, which is in section 37, uh, he has knowledge and vision. Okay, this is in a sense like special to the Buddha. Here he knows and sees from direct experience. He has direct knowledge, he sees causes and conditions in the proper way, and when he teaches there are wonders, there are beautiful things happen. People begin to change, become better, and and they become awakened and so on. So this is the second reason why the, his followers respect him, why we respect him. The third reason is in sec section 38. Here is high, he calls this higher wisdom, and this is what is called a supreme aggregate of wisdom. This is the third training. Here, uh, the Buddha is able to see any kind of argument that may arise. He, he, is, able, he is a good debater. Uh, he's able to teach the Dhamma in a reasonable way to convince others, especially outsiders. He's able to relate to any teaching given by outsiders uh, and when asked uh, about what the Buddha thinks. And again, here he teaches the Dhamma with its wonders. So these are the first three, and then, okay, number four, he completely understands the Four Noble Truths in all the details. And uh, whenever he teaches the Four Noble Truths, people are convinced very clearly, very fully on, on this Four Noble Truths. Okay, so this one, two, three, four, they, they are very uh, brief reasons. It is section five, which kind of covers the whole series of teachings uh, of the Buddha. If you look on page 197, you can see the summary. Uh, I've kind of listed out different, different sets here. For example, uh, the, I call it the path to awakening, the reason number five as the path to awakening. And this is found in sec sections 14 to 59. So you can see here it's quite a long section. Uh, the five reasons are not equally divided. The first four very short paragraphs, whereas the fifth reason so takes the rest of the sutta. A huge section of the sutta, sections 14 to 59. And there are a total of 19 different kinds of teachings which he mentioned. These are all the important teachings, including meditation and so on. Now, the first seven teachings are very famous. They are called the seven sets. These are the four focuses of mindfulness, the four right strivings or right efforts, the four paths of spiritual power, the four spiritual faculties, the five spiritual powers, 
the seven awakening factors and the Noble Eightfold Path. These are the, this is a very ancient set, it's the core of Buddhism. The seven sets combined together, you get 37 factors of awakening. Okay? So it's 37 limbs of awakening. And then in the next three section, nine, eight, nine, ten, you have some kind of extra teachings. You have the eight liberations, the eight bases of mastery, and the ten casinas. Uh, so these are dhyana-based practices. And then section number eleven is the four dhyanas themselves, and. Uh, you have in, inside knowledge of the body, then the mind made body, psychic powers, and so on, divine ear, mind, uh, sorry, up, up to the mind, mind made body number 13. Uh, this uh, found in the Samanya Pala Sutta. And then the last section, the six super knowledges from uh, number 15 to 19 number 14 to 19. Let me just briefly go to them. If you are new to them, let me just quickly explain because this is the, the last section. So, the first is quite easy you know, of the fifth reason. And this is found in section 41. Okay. They follow respect to Buddha because he understands the Four focuses on mindfulness, that is body-based meditation, and then we have feeling-based meditation, mind-based meditation, and, and dharma-based meditation. In others, when, when we begin meditating, we've got to start being aware of the body, such as the breath. And then, section 42, we respect the Buddha because he understands, he teaches the four right strivings, or the four right efforts. And this is the effort to restrain, in other words, not to do something bad that we have not done before, keep it that way, and then to abandon whatever wrong things we have done, wrong habits we have. These two are the negative aspects. Then the third right effort is to cultivate something good we have not done before, like we have not meditated before, we start meditating. And then the fourth right effort is to guard, to protect, to sustain this kind of good effort. So these are the four right efforts. And then you have the four, the, the four paths of spiritual power. Uh, this is to how to cultivate uh, our practice in such a way we can really attain wisdom of a high caliber, even psychic powers, because of the term it is mentioned here. So here, the first path to spiritual power is enthusiasm or willpower. You've got to put in this effort, mental effort. Number two is effort itself or energy. Number three, the mind, to, to make sure the mind is in the right condition and preparation for this practice. And finally, investigation. In other words, looking at the, the nature of the mind. So these are practical aspects of meditation practice. And then comes the very important five spiritual faculties, Panjindriya, in section 44. So here you have the faculty of faith, effort, mindfulness, facult, uh, faculty of concentration and wisdom. The key faculty here is mindfulness. When we meditate, we cultivate mindfulness. And it is a mindfulness that balances faith with wisdom and concentration, uh, <coughs> effort with concentration, and keeping everything in a harmonious balance so that your meditation will fruit in a positive way. And this is the faculty of the ordinary person. Now, in the case of the, the saints, uh, especially the Arahat, they have the same uh, special faculties, but they are, they are adept, they are so good in their practice that uh, the, these faculties are called powers, the Kabbalah, Panchabala, and they, they do the same. There is faith, effort, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom.
what they are called powers. Whereas in the case of someone who is not awakened, or not an arahat yet, it's called simply indriyas or faculties. And then there are the seven awakening factors. Here again, these are like seven steps uh, in your meditation to attain uh, the deep level of meditation. In this case, it's called equanimity. So here, number one is mindfulness. From mindfulness, you're going to have dharma investigation. You uh, note the uh, mental states, reflect on them. And then you put in effort and energy, number three. And number four, zest arises, PT arises as a result. And then tranquility, the mind, body become peaceful. And then there is stillness, samadhi or mental concentration. And finally, equanimity, mental stillness, which includes jhana. So these are the seven awakening factors which the Buddha has formulated and understands completely. Then number seven, we are still in the this is number five here, is the noble eightfold path. Right? So here there's right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So here you can see is the teachings being listed. Then comes two very difficult teachings. I think these are quite late teachings in the Buddha's own time. That the eight liberations. They refer to dhyana-based practices where the person's mind becomes free. And then uh, in the, the eight liberation is special because it, the last one, number eight, is the cessation of perception and feeling, which only non returners and arahats can attain. Then um, number nine is the eight basis of mastery, the abhibhayatana. And here it's also to do with dhyanas. And these are the various uh, practices that a person can practice to help them attain the goal of the path. And then section 10, here is number 50, section 50, brackets 10, you have uh, the 10 casinas. Okay, first you have the first four uh, elements casina. Earth Kasina, Water Kasina, Fire Kasina, Wind Kasina. This is the section 50. Basically, Earth Kasina is where this meditator observes Earth in a, in a certain specific way until he's able to mentally project Earth. So, this is a basis of psychic powers. For example, if the meditator is very good in Earth Kasina and then he sees water and he reflects as Earth and is able to walk over the water as if it is earth. So it is a, a mental effect that he creates for himself. And fire, there's fire, so again he, he's able to create fire. Wind, earth, water, fire, wind is the first four. And then there are the color casinas, blue, yellow, red, and white. Only these four colors are prescribed. I'm not sure of the reason, it seems to be kind of the Indian primary colors, I suppose. Uh, these colors, of course, would help the meditator in his meditation. These are helping meditations. And then you have space kasina, consciousness kasina, and later on light kasina is also added in. But here you have the ten kasinas mentioned in the suttas. And then eleven, the four dhyanas are mentioned, of course. The four dhyanas, we are all very familiar with them. First dhyana, you have the five dhyana factors present, and then the second dhyana, vitaka vichara, this uh, initial application, sasin application are removed, and you have the third uh, dhyana where the mind is even more calm without any more piti, any more uh, exuberant kind of uh, uh, joyful interest, and the last one, is fourth jhana is pure equanimity, if you like. Then number 12 is, uh, 12 and 13 again, uh, the kind of a pair, is the, the Buddha's understanding of the body. So in section 52, the Buddha says, uh, this body of mine is form, composed of the four great elements, born from mother and father, nourished with rice and porridge, subject to inconstancy, rubbing, pressing, dissolution and dispersion. 
And this consciousness of mind lies attached here, bound up here. Okay? So this is a kind of the Buddha's definition of the nature of the body. So and then he gives a, a parable, says this like a, a kind of a glass bead, a beryl gem, beautiful, very pure, and there's a string going through it. Okay, so it's, then number thirteen. He has knowledge of the mind made body. So this is where when a person goes into deep meditation, he's able to generate another body. In other words, the physical body remains in meditation and then the mental body is able to rise up and out of this body, so to speak. I suppose this the this is what we today call an astral body perhaps. And this is the body which moves around, is able to like, teach others uh, elsewhere, far away, like the Buddha taught Dania and so on. So these are explanations on some of the abilities of the Buddha, which are superhuman, so to speak. And then the, 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 the last part, section 14 onwards, right, to 19, are the various powers that the Buddha has. So here we have uh, section 54 to 59, right? So here I'll just briefly mention you have the various psychic powers. He's able to multiply himself, disappear, appear, and so on. And he has a divine ear or clairaudience. He's able to hear things which are far away. And we have some amusing situations here when he uses his power. For example, he is still in, uh, somewhere, say, on Vulture Peak, and then. <coughs> A little distance away, someone sees him coming and then talks bad about him and says, Oh, this, this monk who, who is a loner is coming, and uh, we, we will knock him down with the debate. And he comes along and said, Okay, uh, let's see how we can do this. No, see, he actually knows what those people are saying, like in, in the Udumbarika Sihanata Sutta. And then there is mind reading. And this is very helpful because as a teacher, as a meditation teacher, is able to read the person's mind and gives the right teachings. Uh, is able to counsel the person, like Angulimala, is able to read his mind and help him. Then, 17, he has the knowledge of the recollection of past lives. He knows uh, his own past lives. Okay, so, that in other words, here, there is rebirth. And then, knowledge number 18, which is section 58. There is the divine eye. Here is where he is able to know the past lives of others, how they arose in happy states or suffering states because of the karma. So this is, the, for him, is a confirmation of the teaching of the reality, the truth of karma. So your rebirth, your karma. And then the most important one is 19, the knowledge of the destruction of the mental influxes. This is in section 59. This is the destruction of all the defilements that bring suffering and existence in samsara. So the Buddha has overcome uh, all this and uh, because of this he is no more reborn. He becomes Buddha, he is awakened, he is uh, the Buddha himself. So these are called mental influxes which are totally uh, removed from the Buddha. Then the Buddha says that uh, this wisdom is like a clear mountain pool. When you look at it, you can see whatever things there are in the water. So his mind is very clear. And it is because of this fifth quality that the Buddha is totally free from all defilements. He is totally awakened that that his Buddha is, is an arahat, that his disciples, that we respect him. So there you are, if you can see, it's quite a whole series of teachings, many of which we are really quite familiar with, and all listed nicely for the edification of Mahasakuru, for the edification of Sakuru Dai. And Sakuru Dai is even more impressed now. So now he knows the actual five reasons that the Buddha is suspected by his followers and by us today. So the Sutta ends there. The 
significance of this teaching is that we should know the right reasons why we respect the Buddha. Not because of his external uh, qualities, but his spiritual qualities and attainments and the fact that his Buddha is awakened and his teachings able to awaken us. So do look at this sutta and take your time to study them step by step and reflect on the wonderful teaching of the Buddha. Let us now close with a short reflection. To know the Buddha is not always easy. Even when we meet the Buddha, we may not be able to understand him. We need attention and, a, and some, some kind of preparation to receive his teachings. That is why we need to keep our minds calm and clear and ready to receive the teachings. Otherwise, we'll be only blaming the teacher, blaming the teaching. But when we're ready, it's like having rich till ground, just plant the crops properly watered and taken care of and the plants will grow and fruit beautifully. Reflecting in this way is wonderful good karma. But a part of such karma may we be blessed with the courage and wisdom to aspire to attain at least stream winning in this life itself. And by the power of the tree jewels and all the good we have done that are sent out our loving kindness to ourselves and to our loved ones, may they be well and happy. That those who are practicing the Dharma, that they may see the Dharma in an awakening in this life itself. And also, may all those who are still seeking the Dharma, who are still lost and having difficulties, find their liberation in the Dharma in this life itself. May all beings be well and happy. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu.